Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, Chris, and uh, welcome everybody. Um, so I'm uh, Sean Harrigan from the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasts, based in Reading in the UK. Um, uh, acronym ESIMWF, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, and I'm going to talk today on the growing need for large-scale hydrological forecasting under climate change. Um, so uh, just a little bit about myself uh, first and my hydrological career so far. So um, uh, as you can tell from the accent, um, I'm originally from Ireland and that's where I did the majority of my studies and um, through undergrad to PhD. Um, and so really, uh, I think the story is, you know, how did I get into a career in hydrology? And it, it wasn't obvious by no means. It wasn't something I, I woke up one day and thought as a young person, this was for me. I, I just uh, stumbled across it uh, based on my interest. I studied geography and maths at university uh, and, and just naturally liked numbers and liked how the world works. And so that kind of uh, piqued my interest in both climate and hydrology, the two, two joint subjects. Uh, that led me on to a master's in climate change uh, that I was able to study hydrological components in, which was was, was I really wanted. And a couple of, I'm going to go through a couple of kind of lessons or kind of key things along my journey kind of as a hydrologist that I think were quite important for those who are maybe on that on, on that path as well. Um, so even though I was studying a lot of the science, I got the opportunity to be involved in a, a flood survey based on the November 2009 events, um, flood event that affected both um, the west of Ireland and the northwest of the UK and Cumbria. And that survey was actually more of almost a social science experiment than a scientific one. But what it really taught me was the importance of the event and the, the kind of human impact these floods have on people. And that really helped me kind of, um, it kind of really brought what we're studying and the numbers we're running and the models we're running and the observations we're analyzing into the fore and the importance of the work we're doing. And I think that was quite important and and kind of deciding where I went next. Um, I wasn't quite sure after my master's whether a PhD was for me. I liked the research element, but I, I just wasn't sure it was a PhD the right option. So instead, um, I, I, I spent took a year out and worked as a research assistant uh, within uh, one of the research centers at the university, the ICRIS, Irish Climate Analysis and Research Units. And so there I got a chance to actually work on a research project um, being paid. And um, that's the first time I actually came across to the Peter Wolf event. So that's over 10 years ago now. It was in Loughborough. Um, and working with Rob Wilby and colleagues there was uh, you know, a really important part actually of my development. And uh, in terms of then moving on to a PhD, um, working with my, my supervisors and Rob was also working on that project. And so that brought me on to a, a PhD in hydroclimatology. And so that's when I, I kind of brought my two kind of interests in climate and hydrology together. Um, and just three things I'm looking back at my PhD that I, I felt were really important. Um, and, you know, we're talking about innovation um, today. And sometimes innovation can, of course, be ideas and be like a scientific thing that I was working on. But often PhDs, you're, you're, very few people have the opportunity to be groundbreaking in terms of the work they're doing. Often you're just chipping it away at a problem and you're making your individual contribution to that as best you can. And so sometimes for me then, in terms of career, it wasn't this grand um, idea that necessarily that was looking back the most important thing. I think there was three main things that occurred. It was one, when I was very early on, um, just started my PhD, uh, there was a workshop on floods and climate in Potsdam in Germany. And I remember going and it was a fantastic workshop and the, 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 the room kind of decided that we, there would be a paper written, a clever uh, paper um, on a perspective piece. And as a, as a new PhD student, I, you know, the email came for contributions and I, you know, originally thought not, I have nothing to say given this list of very uh, famous authors. But I decided, I went back and just decided, maybe I'll just chance, write a paragraph um, and see what happens. And it turns out that that paragraph was accepted in, in, the, in, the, in the paper. And that was a, you know, a, a contributing author and it's done really well. And I think that was quite important to understand that you can make a small contribution to these large papers, you have, you have value to be said. The second thing, when going to, to look to go to conferences, I didn't really know many people in the area uh, working in hydrology. I was going to the EGU at the time. Um, and so I uh, seen uh, a couple of people wanting to start a new hydrological society for young people, early career scientists, back in 2013. And I joined, just sent an email and got involved. 
and that turned into be very um, very important for building other colleagues and and you know people that have collaborated collaborated with since and that was the birth of the Young Hydrologic Society which has you know is now compared to, to, to when even back in 2013 there wasn't very many early career events at these large international conferences but if you go to one today which we hope to do in person soon um, you know that's quite common now to have short courses and have dedicated um, events for early career scientists so I think that was a really important thing just to get involved if you see these initiatives I think it's really valuable to, um, to, to, to just lend a hand and, and contribute. And then the third thing was um, I went to summer school that, uh, in NCAR, ASP Advanced Summer uh, Study Program in Climate Change in Boulder in the USA. And that was uh, from a scientific point of view as well as um, cl uh, collaboration with other scientists, really valuable. And so I'd highly recommend if you see these opportunities to just, just to apply. Um, and, you know, it's if you, if you, are lucky enough to get selected they're fantastic so that led me on to um you know finishing studying and i had to decide whether to go into academia or go into um research i wasn't sure um an opportunity came up to join a position at uh, the ukch in wallingford in the uk um as a research associate in hydroclimatology and there i worked uh, on the uk benchmark network um which is a network of uh, kind of catchments for use for uh, analysis of long-term trends um, in the UK. Um, but, uh, but I think really important on, on what this led me into the area of hydrological forecasting through the hydrological outlook um, project. And so that kind of really piqued my interest in scientifically and um, just in terms of a real world application. And that's kind of brought me to where I am now working at the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. And so my role is working on hydrological forecast evaluation and what our key role is, is bringing research to operations um, at large scale hydrological forecasting systems. So the EFAS and GOFAS, which is the European and Global Flood Awareness System. And I'll speak a little about, about that next. And so just in terms of, you know, climate change and what, uh, what, how that is modifying flood attributes, I think it's modifying in, in very complex ways. And so really, uh, some of the early studies or the new studies that bring in these European networks of observations have been able to show that we see changes in timing of flood events across Europe that is either happening later or earlier than usual. We also see that the magnitude of floods are also changing, increasing in some parts of Europe, decreasing in others, so not necessarily a, the same signal. And other aspects of flooding that I think is important and why these large scale systems, in my opinion, are so important is flooding does not occur in isolated events. It's not a single, often a single catchment floods. The most damaging events are multi catchment, multi country events. And we can see from this work that we've done with uh, Voyager Berkhaus um, that if we look at this, the flood synchronicity, so when floods occur at the same time, we can actually see patterns emerge across the continent. Um, when we look at the observations, we can see that the actual spatial extent of flooding is actually growing over time from the observations. So all these kind of changes when we detect from the observations is implying that we are seeing changes, we need to understand them, and we also need to manage them in terms of how floods are affecting society, and it's not easy. If we look at then the projections, so what are we going to expect to see under a warming climate? Um, we see uh, a fame, uh, quite a well-cited study um, this summer was looking at stationary storms and these large scale systems that was uh, that were in some ways responsible for the, the July uh, flood that affected many countries in Europe uh, this summer. And we see that some of these storms can be slow moving and tend to, within a warming climate can become stationary and stagnant. And this is very damaging. So the, the news on that front in terms of the atmospheric dry risk, um, this is one example, is, is not good news. Um, and we also, I would highly recommend, you know, having a look at the, the new sixth assessment report from the IPCC. Um, chapter eight looks at the water cycle changes. And indeed, it's not very clear. There's no one obvious signal in terms of how floods are going to manifest under warming climate. It's complex with land and atmospheric and human kind of contributions. But the basics are, are there, you know, the, 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 the water cycle is intensifying. Um, and when we, these events occur, what we've seen from recent examples is entirely consistent with what we expect to happen. And this kind of brings us to, to this event in terms of what's just happened. Um, I'm sure you've all heard about this in the news. It's, it, it was everywhere. Um, 
It was devastating, despite what we know. I think that has the, the key thing that summarizes it for me is all the models we understand, all the data we have, all the science we've been doing, all the forecasting systems we've been put in place over the last 40 years, yet the, there were still you know, at least 230 people um, died, at least 2.5 billion in damages. Um, it affected, you know, here's just a few countries that, that over that month were hit with a flood, not necessarily from the exact same event, but it was, it, it's complicated. But over that month, we have, you know, nine countries here, you know, with severe damages ranging uh, depending on which country. And um, I, I think for me, that, that in terms of the, the, the kind of the shock of that system, it was a July event. Okay, it was in the summer. So that co contributed to probably the, in a way, surprise. But was it a surprise is, is also a question we've asked. And this is where uh, comes into our, my own work uh, currently is I work in a European Commission uh, project for the East and the Beth is the Computational Centre. Um, it's for the Copernicus Emergency Management Service. So it's an early warning and monitoring service. And in that we run this European flood awareness system and that some of you may or may not be aware of. And if we look at just the signal from um, EFAS, several days so in the medium range so you know two three four five days in advance um, and I, I'm showing one picture here but I, I've also been talking to um, duty forecasters who were working in the countries um, that were mostly affected and here and there anecdotal kind of stories and from both from a, a meteorological point of view and from a hydrological forecast point of view the signal was in the system three four five days ahead um, here's this one example in the River Meuse in Belgium. Um, this was uh, initialized um, on Monday the 12th. And you can see that the peak really happened on Thursday the 15th. And so the signal was here. It was already there several days before. Um, and so you can see the spatial extent of, of that signal. So each um, kind of red square signifies a point in the river network that the five-year flood return period is being exceeded or predicted to be exceeded to, with some probability. Um, and so you can see the spatial extent was already forecast in advance. We can see that there was high, uh, some members were showing very, very extreme flooding. Um, and what that says to us is, you know, we're, we're quite happy from a prediction point of view that at least the signal was in the system. Um, and from, you know, our job is to provide the forecast, to provide the operational forecast every single day, twice per day um, to the, the centers uh, across Europe. Um, but what, what was interesting is, it, and it's not our role, is then the, the use of that forecast for decision making on the ground. And that's where, where I, I step off and that's where our job is, is, not, uh, is not included. But what is interesting is that speaking to these people, it seemed to be that um, a couple of key things is the fact that there was such a persistent signal in July made them quite aware that something was quite um, uh, worrying happening. When speaking to the relative local authorities, a lot of people just didn't want to believe this. It was July. People were on the rivers for recreational purposes. Um, you know, a flood in July had not been experienced really in some of these areas before. And so I think there's going to be a lot of work. Um, so, so on one hand, there was definitely action made. I, I know for sure in several countries, there was definitely things that were put in place uh, several days ahead and as the, as the event neared. But as we know from the devastation, there's many, many lessons we can learn um, and, and how science and policy and decision making um, come together. I think that gap is very obviously very, very wide still. And so uh, more than from, you know, how a system like EFAS or it's, or it's, uh, it's, uh, it's global um, comparison, GOFAS, from, from our point of view then, in terms of our, my role and the role of Eastern WF, you know, what actually happens on a day-to-day -day or a month-to-month -month basis to keep these systems operational and working. And so I'll just give a little bit of timeline to the last year of what we've been working on and just to show, just to give you a flavor of some of the things. So, you know, these systems are, have been operational for quite some time now. Over the last year, we have done a lot of work updating static maps to improve the underlying soil and underlying kind of rainfall maps, everything. Um, we've, and the European model has been through a major calibration. Um, so it went from a 24-hour um, daily time step to a six-hour time step across the European domain. And if you see the map here on the bottom, um, the red catchments or area highlights um, every, everywhere that the model was actually calibrated with observations. So, and I think that's quite impressive. It's the first time I believe we've had such 
European wide coverage of observation oh, and coverage. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that is about 4 million kilometer squares of an area was calibrated. Um, and so that's been operation since October. Yeah, if we look at our global counterpart, we have uh, improvements to the web. We now have all the data from the simulations and the forecasts are all open and open access. Um, new scale products and as well as um, impact uh, maps, so rapid impact mapping. So when a flood occurs, we can also get a first estimate of the damage. Um, and so that's just give you an idea of the type of things we've been working on over a, a typical a year. It's been quite a busy year, as we know, that lead to a system that's able to predict these flood events several days in advance. So quite a lot of work going on underneath. And I think what, what, what that when we get to the point of having these large scale systems, um, we see we, we can do other things like I, I think what's been missing at a European scale has been the understanding of how hydrology is changing. So yes, we have some networks and observations and observations are, are the most important thing. They, they're not a replacement and assimilation cannot replace observations, but what observations can't do is give us a complete spatial temporal picture. And so we've um, been able to contribute to the European State of the Climate 2020 report that's um, led by the European Commission. And so we can get a river discharge. Um, uh, we can look at how river discharge has changed across Europe over the last year. So in near real time, essentially, and we can see different patterns of um, you know, high and low events. And so this is just one illustration in October we can see that over Storm Alex, we can actually get some interesting statistics. So we, we know that over 60% of the river network in Northwest uh, Northeast Europe and the Danube had above average river flows. So you can see from the graph to the right. And this is the type of thing that I don't think has been possible before. So I think it's quite a, a, a real interesting thing to be able to do to understand the spatial patterns of, of changes in hydrology. Um, again, I do always caveat that these are simulations and they have to be um, use within the context of what the observations say but at least we have uh, it's a piece of information i think it's it's interesting and we can use um, and so we can then create things like uh, the evolution throughout the year we can look at where, what areas were exceptionally high exceptionally low we, we know that floods and droughts aren't um, completely separate um, and, uh, and understanding that dynamic um, and how it moves across the continent i think uh, opens up a lot of scientific questions and possibilities so all that data is uh, freely available and, and um, completely um, open for uh, innovation, I should say. And so just to, to summarize, um, and, and just, you know, reflecting back in the, my career and reflecting back in the work that I've, I've done now and what, what the important things is, the thing I think we've learned is, you know, innovation, in my perspective, is collaborative. If I look at the, the data and the systems we're running, it's, it's not an individual person, it's not an individual company. You know, in, in the EFAS model, we, we have all the partner organizations across Europe that give data. We have a hydrological data collection center. We have a meteorological data collection center. We have the computational and the dissemination of the forecasts with many organizations working together to produce that. Um, also, I would say innovation happens by starting, getting it running, learning by doing and building in progress. So of course you can have these one-off fantastic ideas and, and that's brilliant if, that, if you can you know, achieve that. But I, I use the, the example of weather forecasting um, and this famous paper, the, the Quiet Revolution of Numerical Weather Prediction. Um, essentially, we gain one day skill every 10 years of research development. And that might seem like very little progress, but if you look at this from the 70s, you know, we can predict three, four days ahead better than we could you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. And so that is the same kind of, um, the, the, where we are from the hydrological forecasting point of view, if we can gain one, two day skill over the next five, 10 years of development and research, then that's going to help decision makers and just provide you know, a more robust um, kind of uh, set of tools for decision makers um, in terms of flooding. As we've seen from the evidence, both observations and, and future, uh, this is something we're going to have to really deal with uh, going forward. And so finally then, I think it's going to take a community to prepare for the climate emergency. For the benefit of society, uh, we we needed we, we know data sharing is a huge issue in hydrology, but it's something we're getting there with slowly but surely. We know models are being developed at different places, but again, I think the more people and the more expertise we have in expanding these models, not just hydrology but also into the earth system, is going to be important. We, we've seen um, open source code and the benefit of that rather than uh, closed systems. 
And really it's about bringing the, the scientific technical computational expertise across disciplines. And that's something that uh, I don't think we as hydrologists can solve by ourselves. We're going to have to contribute to other disciplines. And being at Eastern DeBeth has really taught me um, working with climate scientists and, and uh, meteorologists has been you know, hugely um, uh, fruitful and, and uh, valuable. And I, I think what we've seen from the events, you know, we haven't solved this problem, even though we have all these fancy systems and advanced uh, forecasts from all uh, you know, from a European scale and at a local scale. We still see a gap between science and decision making, um, and that remains a huge challenge. So I think um, uh, everybody here that's going into a career in hydrology, I think there's plenty of need for our skills. So, um, yeah, any questions? Happy to take. So thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, uh, we've, we're a little couple of minutes by, behind schedule, um, so we'll put aside a couple of minutes here for, for questions for Sean, please. Um, you can either raise your hand, we'll try, if you could stop sharing your screen actually, that would help, please, yeah. Sean, thank you. Um, yeah, raise your hand and we'll try and get to you. Um, otherwise, please put some questions in, in the chat. So we've got a, a couple of minutes there. Um, just while we are waiting for, for that, um, you, you started off talking about your career, uh, Sean. Would you say that the would you say that the point you're at in your career is where you envisaged your career was going to go, or do you think it's evolved in a slightly different way to perhaps you ever thought it might have done when you when you first set off? Yeah, completely. I, I, I maybe some people have a very clear idea what they want to do. I definitely didn't, and I think every single time has been guided by just interest so i was interested in you know when a university hydrology i didn't go to university study hydrology it just naturally happened that way um you know right through to the phd topic right through to even the topics you know studying at, at ch and then moving on it's it just interest in hydrological forecasting it was not something i ever even worked on i didn't even work in hydrological forecasting my phd um, and this is now the topic I've, I've kind of moved into you know being professional uh, working in and so i think just I've always just followed, followed the kind of path of interest and see where it goes. <laughs> There's no grand... Uh... No grand plan. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, uh, I mean, I can certainly echo those comments from, from my perspective, I'm sure probably that uh, a lot of us probably can, which is, um, yeah, if you're setting off in your career, whilst you might have interest and ideas where it might go, it can often end up in a, in a, in a different place and often usually a lot better. Perhaps, you know, I, I, think, you could... I think the big one... Chris, sorry, is, is the, the, the surprise probably is um, I, I went during my PhD, I just envisaged, I just thought I would be working in academia. That's where I presumed I would work and would be happy. And I was quite concerned moving away from academia into research then into operations. Maybe yeah. that would be damaging for, for publications and stuff like that. But I found the opposite. I found it much, you know, as equally as fruitful in, in terms of ideas and being able to write papers and stuff. So that's not a worry. If somebody has a worry of that, I, I wouldn't worry about that. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Um, Daryl Hughes, um, you have your hand up, um, please. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Sean, for the, the presentation. Uh, it's great to see um, where you've gone over the last 10 years of your career. Um, I was really interested that you said, um, well, you, the, the, the forecasters encountered uh, incredulity on behalf of uh, decision makers. And I was wondering whether you think there's a greater role for uh, 3D or 4D visualization um, in, in combating that. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a really uh, important question, to be honest, because now, whilst I wasn't there, but I was speaking to a colleague in the Netherlands this morning, and he, he said that some, he says, interestingly, things have changed over the last couple of years. So he was involved with, uh, you know, essentially working with the, the Dutch government. And he said the use of ensemb the, the ensemble plumes, he says, Sometimes in the past, it was always like, oh, I don't understand that. I want a number. I want a single line. But he said, even though at the time, three, four days ahead, there was a small 10, 15% probability of a really significant event, that changed. He said, it, it didn't happen that one meeting. It took several days. But as the, 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 as the forecast developed and as the ensemble plume kind of changed and merged, uh, you know, as it got more certain, that really set the kind of the tone of the discussions. But I think, you know, that's one way we do it. I think there's many, I think that, as he said, so essentially that, that was a visualization that, that set the discussion. And so if we can improve that element of how to understand the probabilities and uncertainties in our forecasts to local decision makers or to people on the ground and do better at that. I think that would be one very important step 
to, to make big inroads. So uh, yeah, good points, definitely. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Daryl, and thanks, uh, Sean. Um, just with an eye on time, we, we are running a little bit behind, so I think we'll, we'll call that uh, your part to a close. But thank you very much, Sean. Um, there may be a couple of questions that might come sort of your way in the panel discussion at the end, but um, I think that's, that's you. Thank you. Um, we're going to try again now with uh, Linda Spate, who um, uh, we had an aborted attempt earlier. Um, just before we get to Linda, um, again, just apologise if uh, some of you, if some of you had some technical issues getting online uh, this morning. Zoom seems to be having uh, a few issues, um, so I'm sorry uh, if it took a little while to get get on. Uh, and if any of your colleagues are struggling, please ask them to, to persevere. And just a quick reminder, please, if you're uh, just to check your microphones are muted uh, for, uh, during the presentations, that would be great, please. Um, Linda, I'll pass over to you. I'll share your slides and you'll have to uh, uh, say next slide in, a, in the, the best